Man, what a powerful message in a simple song. If you've got a Bible this morning, I want to invite you to the book of Philippians chapter number one. Years ago, there was another powerful message that was written in a simple song by a songwriter by the name of Gary Driscoll. And years ago, Gary Driscoll penned these words. He said, so many souls have tested him throughout the course of time. So many still reach out to him with broken hearts and minds. And every one of them will say, without exception, that they find that Jesus never fails. In order that we may reverence the Word of God and the God of the Word, would you stand with me this morning? Philippians chapter 1. I want to begin our reading this morning at verse number 12. God's Word says, But I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Father, we love you, and we thank you again for your written word. Father, we're thankful for the promise that your word tells us and in this passage for the truth that we can garner, and that is, Lord, that, that you never fail. Father, I pray today that you would just open our hearts and our minds to the truths that are here. Help us to accept these truths, not as the word of men, but as the word of God. And I pray, Lord God, that you would just help each one of us not just to hear this message, but to heed it and to apply it to our lives. May you receive all honor and glory in these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I want to tell you that uh, it has been a, a good week this past week for me. Uh, many of us uh, went to church camp this past week. And I want to tell you that church camp beds are not any better this year than they were last year. And I want to tell you that the church camp weather was not any nicer than it was any previous year. I want to tell you that the dust and the effects of sleeping essentially outside have affected me just as much this year as it has every other year. But I want to tell you what a week. It was a fantastic week. But you know, I saw something at church camp this year that I just have to assume has always been. I've just never really noticed it. And I noticed that there at church camp, in all of the people that were represented, I really saw a microcosm of all people in walks of life. Uh, let me explain what I mean. You see, as I sat at church camp and as I listened to people talk and, uh, and as I listened to people visit, we sat surrounded by pain and by hurt. Let me explain just briefly. While we were at camp, one family, large family, was informed that their pet at home had passed away. And it negatively affected uh, several of the campers that were there. While we were there, I was visiting with one young man who informed me that he had just recently been fired and didn't have a clue where he was going to go work next. A husband and a wife shared some of their problems with infertility. There was uh, one camper, after I preached a message that was called God is Good, one camper came up to me and said, I want to believe that God is good, but I'm really struggling with that. I had another camper who was still showing the visible signs of her battle with cancer. Said, I'm awaiting the test results. The cancer may be back. We don't know. i would met another camper who shared with me that he had never met his father. That his father had chosen a life of, of drugs and crime rather than being a dad. And there was another camper uh, uh, that shared that his father had been killed about four days before we went to camp. 
Uh, and as I sat at camp and I just listened to people share their stories and as I saw where people were coming through I, I'm telling you there was hurt and there was pain scattered throughout every person uh, and I want to tell you that this is not something that is isolated uh, to church camp this is something that if we will open our eyes you will see all over the place but I want to tell you this if we're not careful we can walk around discouraged because of the pain and the hurt that exists. If we're not careful, we can walk around depressed. We can walk around despondent. And if we're not careful, we can live lives that are defeated because of the pain and the hurt. But I want to share this truth with you this morning. Jesus never fails. Amen. That thought came across my mind so many times this week. That God is big and Jesus never fails. Now, I want to tell you this morning, I'll just be uh, very transparent with you. This is a message that is easy to preach, but it's a message that's hard to live. And so I, I want to just, I, I want to go back and I want to observe this passage. Because the reality is, though I spoke some truths from those that were at church camp, we could go around this room and share the very same things. That there's pain and there's hurt and there is the potential for us to lose sight of focusing on God and to really begin to focus on all of the pain and the hurt. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to encourage you. And I want to educate you just a little bit based on the Word of God. And I want to tell you that there are three truths inside this passage that can help us uh, and can remind us that Jesus never fails. You say, preacher, how can Paul's little introduction here, how can this help me? How can this remind me that Jesus never fails well I want to share with you the first of these three truths and that is this what Paul does as he's writing to the church at Philippi Paul is writing to inform them that number one there's always a bigger picture if you're writing notes you can write that down if you're not that was a spot for an amen there's always a bigger picture now, now I want you to notice back in verse number 12 did you see what the Apostle Paul wrote beginning there at verse number 12 he says but I would ye should understand. Every once in a while, the Apostle Paul writes in kind of an odd way, uh, and, and sometimes his verbiage comes across uh, in, a, in a, a language and a sentence structure different than what we would say. But essentially, that word understand comes from a Greek word, gnosko, which means to know or hear this part. It means to perceive properly. The Apostle Paul is sitting in a prison right now as he is writing this letter. And it's believed that, that those uh, church members there at the church at Philippi were despondent. They were discouraged. They were depressed. And they were almost defeated that here's someone they know about, they care about for no other reason than preaching the gospel. And now he's been imprisoned. And the pain and the hurt began to affect and to change their lives. And so Paul says this, <laughs> He says, I want you to have a clear picture. I want you to have a clear understanding. I want you to have a proper perception of what is really going on. And here's essentially, I want to break this down a little bit further. And here's what Paul shared with them. He said, if you want this clear understanding, Paul says, if you want to see the bigger picture, then Paul says this. He says, Jesus didn't fail in my situation. Jesus didn't fail just because Paul was a prisoner at Rome. Did you notice that he says there in the rest of verse 12 that all of these things that happened to me, they fall out or, or the, the immediate result was the furtherance of the gospel. That word furtherance is a Greek word that means advancement. Paul says, I know you're sad. I know that what you see is hurt. But Paul says, I want you to see things from a different perspective. Paul says, yeah, I'm in this prison, but guess what's happened? The gospel has been advanced oh by the way church that's our job we can have the greatest church service. We can have the greatest church building. We can have the best singing. We can have the best looking church members. But if we don't advance the gospel, then we have not fulfilled our purpose for living. So what is Paul saying? Paul says, look. There's a bigger picture. He says, God, he said, Jesus didn't fail just because I'm here. And I know that this seems like a simple point, but I want to try to just bring this home to a place that you and I can understand. Because it's easy to read about Paul and say, well, we know things worked out well. But here's a truth that can either change your life or rock your world. And here's this truth. Bad things happen to good people. 
Now let me explain. Read through this book right here. Joseph was sold into slavery. David was hunted down by King Saul. Job lost his family and his health. Christ was betrayed and beaten and crucified. Paul was beaten and shipwrecked and stoned and left for dead. And now he is in prison. Bad things happen to people who are serving God. And some of you say, well, preacher, we know all of those stories. What do you mean that this truth will change my life or rock my world? Well, let me just tell you very quickly this morning about a young man. I've mentioned him before, but a young man by the name of Charles Templeton. Charles Templeton was a preacher in the 50s and 60s who, who together with a young preacher by the name of Billy Graham started Youth for Christ International. And Charles Templeton preached uh, uh, all over the United States and all over the world, sometimes to groups of 15 and 20,000 teenagers. And he led only God knows how many people to faith in Jesus Christ. This man had a great ministry. But Charles Templeton, his last book that he wrote was entitled, Farewell to God, My Reasons for Rejecting the Christian Faith. What happened? How could Charles Templeton go from leading so many to Christ to writing a book that said, here's why I just can't believe in Jesus anymore? <clears throat> Charles Templeton struggled with one question. Why do bad things happen to good people and why do good things happen to bad people? Charles Templeton couldn't get beyond. In his mind, when bad things happened, Jesus had failed. And I want to tell you this, that this is a question you may try to brush it off, but it's a question you're going to have to come to grips with. Because this fact that bad things happen to good people, this fact that God's people endure suffering can change your life or it can rock your world. It rocked Charles Templeton's world. And so we today, we need to come to grips with this question. Here's the question that people want to ask. They say, well, preacher, I don't understand. Why wouldn't God just create a world without pain? Why wouldn't God just create a world without suffering? Why wouldn't God create a world where nobody has to hurt? And my answer to them is, he did. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. To those that want to say, well, how could God let this happen? How could God create all of this? God created a very good and a perfect world. And our forefathers, by the name of Adam and Eve, ruined it. You see, God created a perfect place. But sin destroyed it. There's a lot that could be said uh, of a man by the name of Lee Strobel. Many of you probably saw a film that recently came through the theaters called The Case for Christ. Lee Strobel was a reporter who worked for the Chicago Tribune uh, who was an atheist and an unbeliever but found Jesus Christ as his Savior. And Lee Strobel described this world. He said this, that this is a sin-corrupted world. This is not as God created it. And you say, well, preacher, what do you mean? What does all this have to do with anything? That God does care. That God did not create a world. God's intention was not that we would suffer. God's intention was not that we would be filled with pain. That's sin's consequence. You say, well, preacher, I thought God was love. Why doesn't he, why doesn't he just do something about it? <laughs> Read this book. He will. We talked about it. I laughed. We talked about it in Sunday school this morning about a period in time known as the millennial reign of Christ. And during the millennial reign of Christ, it was mentioned in Sunday school today that we're going to go full circle, that the conditions of living are going to be very similar to those in the Garden of Eden. Friends, I'm telling you that God will do something about sin. God is going to utterly destroy sin. And this book tells me that in the new heaven and in the new earth, there is no death. There is no pain. There is no sorrow. There is no crying. All of those things are done away with. You see, the reality is this, is that pain and suffering and hurt exist here and now. But someday, when I stand face to face with Jesus, it will be no more. God didn't fail just because Paul was imprisoned. Now, let me just pause right here. I'm going to take a quick time out. Uh, I'll call this a freebie. This is your extended freebie this morning. I won't even charge you overtime for this. 
But some of you may say, well, okay, preacher, uh, God created a world with no suffering. Sin destroyed it. God is going to destroy sin, and then there's going to be no more suffering. But why does God let us suffer now? Well, let me just put it to you this way. God's not going to waste a good suffering for you. I mean, it's okay to amen that, right? God's not going to waste a good uh, hurting. Let me explain what I mean. Why do people suffer today? Well, let's just be honest. Sometimes we suffer because of our own foolish choices. I mean, we can't deny that part. Uh, we love to say, well, why do bad things happen to good people? But let's just be honest. The Bible says there's none good, not even one. And so sometimes the suffering, the hurt, the pain that we endure is because of our own choices. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 11 says, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. When we get out of line with God's will and God chastens us, uh, it doesn't seem to be fun, but God's not going to waste a good suffering. Because you know what the rest of this verse says? Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So sometimes we endure suffering and pain because it's our fault. But there's sometimes, think of Job. There's sometimes we didn't do anything wrong. But God allows pain, God allows hurt, God allows suffering. And I want to tell you that I believe sometimes we suffer for the maturity that we can gain from it. Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse 3. He says, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us. Sometimes God allows us to endure pain and suffering and hurt because it makes us stronger. Your kid ever start whining and crying because they got to do something hard? I'm not talking about the little guys. I'm talking about you teenagers. <laughs> your kids ever whine and cry? I'm telling you, sometimes the best thing you can say to them is suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> because sometimes doing those hard things is good for them. Why? It makes them stronger. In the, not a kid in here is happy with me right now. <laughs> <laughs> But there are times that God allows us to go through trials and troubles and hurts and pain because it makes us stronger. Thirdly, there's times that we endure suffering because pain teaches us sympathy. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, Who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherein we ourselves are comforted of God. You see, I think this is what Paul, I'm going to get back to the message now. That was your freebie. But I think this is the same concept of what Paul was trying to tell the church at Philippi. I know that there's suffering. I know that this is hard. I know that you think Jesus took a day off, but Paul says, no, he did not. He said, Jesus didn't fail just because of my circumstances. He said, preacher, how can you say that? Because Paul trusted, number two, that Jesus was sovereign. No matter what happens in this life, Jesus does not fail to be sovereign. What do I mean by that word sovereign? The word sovereign means the supreme power. At no point in time does Jesus ever lose control. I love what one preacher said shortly after the Supreme Court of our state uh, uh, said that, that uh, 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 homosexual marriage was perfectly okay. And all the Christians said, oh, Jesus forgot about us. And how could this possibly happen? I love what one preacher said. He said, it doesn't matter what the Supreme Court does. They can't put Jesus back in the tomb. Amen? No matter what happens, Jesus is still supreme. Did you notice in verse number 12 that Paul uses the word rather? These things have fallen out of me rather. That word rather indicates that, that more than likely his readers were saying, oh, Paul, this is terrible. And Paul says, no, 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 this is a good thing. Paul says, this worked out for good. What, could come, uh, what good could come out of Paul being in prison? Notice verse number 13. It was good because every person throughout the entire palace guard knew that Paul was in chains for his crimes. Do you see that in there? <coughs> yeah, I don't either. It's not there. But what does it say? They all knew he was in chains for following Christ. Whether they liked him or whether they didn't, they all knew that he's here for following Jesus. Notice verse number 14. Paul says, because I've been in prison, there are others who have been encouraged to speak with courage and without fear. Here's what Paul's reminding the church at Philippi. These things may seem bad. He said, but Jesus didn't fail. 
Jesus didn't fail just because I went through this particular circumstance and Jesus didn't fail to be sovereign. So what's the bigger picture? When we go through hurt, when we look around and we see that there are hurting people all around us, when it happens to us, see the bigger picture and the bigger picture is this. Though our situations may seem bad, God is bigger. Though our situations may seem bad, God is good. Amen? I'm going to tell you a second truth that this passage teaches us. When we look at this idea that Jesus never fails, and you say, preacher, I want to believe that Jesus never fails, but, but I struggle with this. I constantly think that Jesus forgot about me, and so I'm going to try to remember real hard the bigger picture. But number two, remember this. Here's a truth. <laughs> there are beneficial people. Now, let me explain what I mean by this. Did you know that God did not design the Christian life to be lived in isolation from other Christians? I hope that you would know that. I think I've said that at least once a sermon for the past six weeks, right? God's plan and God's design was that you, as a Christian, would live together in a community with other believers. Why? Because there are beneficial people within a true New Testament church that are, according to the Word of God, to help you bear your burdens. And when you're hurting, there are people that are to pick you up, is what God's Word says. But you know what our problem is? Sometimes when, when we feel the hurt, when we see the bad... Sometimes all we see are the scoundrels. Am I wrong? Sometimes when we look around, all we can see are the scoundrels. Now listen, what's a scoundrel? According to Merriam-Webster, a scoundrel is someone who is deceptive. Uh, one who tries to take advantage of another when they are weak. And oftentimes when we see hurt, all we see around us is other people who are trying to take advantage of us being down. Notice verse number 15. Paul says, Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife. Paul says, listen, I'm in prison, and there are those that are preaching Christ. Uh, most commentators suppose that there was a little uh, fact of people, that there was a little sect of people, perhaps the Judaizers, they didn't like Paul. They didn't like Paul's influence. And all of a sudden, Paul was locked up, and they said, good, now he's out of the way. I can get the limelight. Let me get up here and preach. Paul says, yeah, there's some deceptive people out there. Verse 16, he says, there was one. No one really knows who this one is. He said there was one that was out there and he was preaching Christ of contention. He wasn't even uh, doing it to lift up Christ. He was just doing it to try to injure Paul. Now listen, when you're down, <laughs> there's scoundrels. I wish that there wasn't, but there is. There's always those that are going to be deceptive. Even when you're at your lowest, there are those that are going to attempt to befriend you and, and try to quote unquote help you when all they're doing is looking out for themselves. But friends, I want to tell you that even in Paul's situation, here he is in prison. Here are the scoundrels running around taking advantage of him. But Jesus didn't fail. Because in spite of the scoundrels, Jesus provided supportive people as well. I want you to notice verse number 15. Go back, he says, remember he said, Some preach Christ of envy, but some also of what? Of goodwill. Verse number 17, he says, there's another one that preached of love. The idea of goodwill is the idea of freely or willingly. It is the idea of some preached without any selfish end or without any sinister view of vain glory. Paul said, there's scoundrels out there. There are those that are going to try to take advantage of, uh, of you. But Paul says, guess what? <laughs> There's also those that are going to support you. Paul said, there are those that are preaching willingly, freely. Verse number 17 says, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. Many commentators believe that Paul was making a reference to that there were those who probably wouldn't have got up and, uh, and spoke boldly for Christ if he hadn't been in prison. He said, preacher, what are you talking about? You ever seen one of these scenarios where, where uh, someone uh, gets injured on a football team and next man up? Wouldn't have got a chance to do anything had the guy not been injured. It's a very similar sense. You ever seen it in the Lord's work? Listen, we've seen it in here. Sunday school teacher goes on vacation for four months, whatever it is, right? What happens? Somebody who otherwise would have never had a chance to stand up stands up and, and teaches class wonderfully. It's the same concept that Paul is mentioning here. Some people stepped up. And you know what Paul says? He says, Jesus didn't fail just because I'm in prison. 
He said, actually, Jesus was advanced. He said, there's some people now that are preaching love. Yeah, they're scoundrels. I'd love to tell you that the scoundrels are going to go away. But even at the end of the millennial reign of Christ, they're scoundrels. Right? I'd love to tell you they're going to go away, but not this side of heaven. But friends, I want to tell you, just because you're experiencing hurt and pain, God didn't fail. Jesus didn't fail. You know what our problem is? Maybe I can't say our, maybe I should just say mine. My problem is that when God sends supportive people, I try to shun them. I said, no, God, I know I'm going through all this right now, and I know that I'm, I'm kind of beginning to doubt you, and I know that I'm living in depression and despondency, and I know you send all these people in my life to help me bear my burdens, but don't worry about it, God, I'll take it. Yeah, I didn't think I was the only one. So let me just throw this out here as a word of caution. When we're down, God provides supportive people. So let's be careful not to shun the people that God sends. Amen? Here's what Paul's saying. He said, Jesus didn't fail. Paul says, Jesus didn't fail because there's a bigger picture. I want you to get this proper understanding, he says. Jesus didn't fail because he provided me with supportive people. But I want you to notice this third truth. Paul says, Jesus didn't fail because there is always a reason to praise. It doesn't matter what the circumstances in your life is. There is always a reason to praise him. Did you notice how verse number 18 starts? I love this. <laughs> what then? You know, I mentioned to some of the teens at, uh, uh, at church camp this year as I was preaching to them that there have been times in my ministry uh, that I've taken a little uh, uh, sticky note and I've written on that sticky note, so what? And I've put it right back here where you can't see it, but I can. And it is a reminder to me that the truths in God's word don't do much unless we apply the truth to God's word. And essentially, that's where Paul is. Paul is saying Jesus didn't fail because uh, there's a bigger picture. Jesus didn't fail because he sent me supportive people. And now Paul says in verse number 18, so what? What about it? What difference does it make in anyone's life? What conclusion are we to come from all of this? Paul says, what then? So what? He says, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. Paul says, listen, whether they're doing it uh, to be a scoundrel or whether they're doing it to be a support, Paul says, here's the good news, Christ is being preached. Oh, by the way, aren't you glad that God can take a message preached through an, in, uh, an unclean vessel and still get his will accomplished? Listen, it's never about the preacher. It's about the one the preacher's preaching about. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want you to notice what Paul says. Now, Paul's circumstances haven't changed. Paul's in prison. But he tells them, he says, and I therein, you notice the end of verse 18, and I therein do rejoice. Paul said, I'm going to rejoice that I'm in prison, that people have stood up to preach, that God is using supportive people, that there is a bigger picture at place here. Paul found this reason to rejoice. And I want to tell you, friends, that I don't know every detail about your circumstances, but in spite of your situation, there is a reason to rejoice. Let me put it to you this way. We can rejoice when God works in us. We can rejoice when God works on us. And we can rejoice when God works through us. And that's essentially what Paul said is, yeah, I'm suffering, but God's working through me. And I'm going to rejoice. And I want you to notice, this is probably the thing, this is the thing that really caught my eye and brought me to this passage. Because keep this perspective in mind. Paul's in prison. He's writing uh, to encourage the church at Philippi. And he says, listen, no matter what happened to me, Jesus didn't fail. Christ is being preached, and I'm going to choose to rejoice. But notice what he says at the very end of verse number 18. He says, that's why I rejoice. But you catch that last phrase? And I'm going to keep on rejoicing. Now, that's not King James, but that's what he says, right? He says, I found a reason to be happy right now. And even though I'm not going to get out of this jail tomorrow, I'm going to keep rejoicing. Here's what I want to tell you. When we begin to understand that no matter what happens, Jesus is still sovereign. No matter what happens, Jesus didn't fail. Paul came to the conclusion, I don't care if my circumstances change. I'm going to rejoice today, and I'm going to keep on rejoicing. Friends, I want to tell you this truth. 
knowing that Jesus never fails, allows us to go through this life with an eternal perspective. Listen, there were those at church camp that were awaiting news of, is the cancer back? Oh, but there's coming a day when there's a new body and cancer can't touch it. There were those that, uh, that were dealing with loss. There's coming a day when there's no more death. There were those who were dealing with being unwanted by their father. And there's coming a day when God is going to bring all of his children home, never to see them go. And when we have this understanding that Jesus never fails, we can live in light of eternity. Here's what Paul said, Romans chapter 8, verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You see, Paul's rejoicing did not come from his situation. It came from a steadfast satisfaction that only comes from knowing that Jesus never fails. Gary Driscoll, the one who wrote the song that's entitled Jesus Never Fails, went on in a second verse to write these words. Sometimes this world brings trouble I find so hard to bear. I know I could not make it without Jesus being there. It's so encouraging to know, however deep we're in despair, that Jesus never fails. I want to tell you this morning, friend, I don't know where you are or everything that you're going through. But Jesus doesn't fail. You say, preacher, why am I experiencing hurt? Why am I going through pain? Well, maybe God's working on you. Maybe he's trying to, uh, to mold you into the shape of his son, Jesus. Maybe God is working in you. Or maybe God is just simply working through you and trying to, like the apostle Paul, he's the one that endured prison, but his life changed those in the church of Philippi. Maybe God's working through you. You see, if you're here this morning and you're wrestling and you say, well, I, sometimes I just think that God let me down. Remember, there's always a bigger picture. Paul said, don't get so nearsighted as you forget about the big picture. Number two, this morning, I want you to remember there's beneficial people. I praise God for the men and the women, for the brothers and the sisters that are in this room right here to help support one another. And I want you to remember this. There's always a reason to praise you see, here's the truth. Jesus never fails. It's us that fails. And I know that this is pretty blunt and pretty harsh, but it's us that fail. You say, preacher, what do you mean we fail? Too often I fail to see that Jesus is sovereign in spite of my circumstances. Too often I fail to see the support because I'm blinded by the scoundrels. And too often I fail to be satisfied or I fail to remain steadfast because I fail to remember that Jesus never fails. But I want to tell you this morning on the authority of the Word of God that you can trust in the promise that Jesus never fails. You know, there's a promise in this Word. We talked about sin being what destroyed this earth. Neither you nor I are immune to this. And there's a promise in this word, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says that if we will confess our sin, that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We sin, but God will not fail to forgive you of sin if you'll ask. Did you know that this word also tells me that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved? Jesus will not fail to save those that come to him in repentance and in faith. This morning, with every head bowed and every eye closed, as our song leader and our pianist come,